So if you've ever wondered how to fish massive lakes from shore, even as daunting as it might seem, it's exactly what we're gonna talk about on today's episode of Fly Fish University TV. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Fly Fish University. My name is Jordan Ulrich, I'm your host, and today we are talking about fishing big lakes from shore. If you live somewhere when it's cold, where it's cold in the winter time, like myself in British Columbia, Canada, you are dying to get on the water come early spring. I mean, at this point, you know, I'll take anything I can get. I will go fishing in my bathtub. I just want to get on the water, okay? It's been a long winter, especially, you know, the past winter we just had was a, a little bit different. There was no international traveling taking place. So cabin fever sets in big time for me sometimes. And I think that just the act of fishing without any expectation, just the act of fishing becomes very therapeutic this time of year for me. So today we're talking about fishing big lakes from shore. Now fishing big lakes can be a very, very daunting thing, especially when you are trying to ponder the overall surface area of the water body that you're fishing. Sometimes I'll have a tough day of fishing on a small lake and I'll think, wow, if I can't catch them here, you know, how am I supposed to catch them on some huge water body? But that's the wrong mental approach. And the mental approach that you have to this has, it plays such a huge part in it. So today we're gonna cover five things. And, and the first thing is to, you, you have to break these large water bodies down. Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. I live near a lake called Shushwap Lake. It's a massive, massive uh, freshwater lake. I mean, I mean, it's absolutely huge. It has over a thousand kilometers of shoreline. And I fish it from shore all the time and very successfully. I mean, it's, it's, I actually <laughs> catch more fish shore fishing out there than I would a lot of other small lakes. And that's a lot of it is due to the, the shoreline structure of the lake, which I'll talk about in a minute. But you gotta understand, you're not gonna fish the whole entire thing. Okay, you're not going to fish the whole entire lake at once, so don't even try. What you're gonna do is you're going to specifically plan out some areas of the lake that you're gonna cover. But you have to note that even on a huge lake, okay, even on a massive piece of water, I mean, even look at the Great Lakes, right? Even on a massive piece of water, there are still areas where fish are going to hold close to shore. So it's important to understand that you're just gonna be picking out small pieces of water. And what I like, the analogy I like to use is breaking it down into a bunch of smaller lakes. That's way easier than saying, I'm gonna fish all thousand kilometers of the shore of the shoreline on Shushwap Lake. It's just saying, hey, you know what? I'm gonna, this looks fishy, this area looks fishy. I'm just gonna pretend that the rest of the lake doesn't even exist, not benefiting me in any way, looking around at, at the fact that that area out there, I can cast to a part that's you know 200 feet deep. That doesn't matter, right? It really doesn't matter. What you're gonna focus on are the small pieces of water within the water body that you're fishing. What are the small lakes within the big lake and how can you tackle them more effectively? So you might look at, at one piece of water, let's call it a bay, for example, just look at that bay as its own little lake. Just look at it as it's its own little piece of water. Don't worry about the rest of it, right? You can tackle any large water body from shore, but you need to know where to look, okay? And that leads me into our second thing, which is you wanna find structure that is attracting fish. Easier than going to find them all the time is go where they already are. Go where fish are already hanging out, and you're gonna do that by finding pieces of structure that are attracting them from a distance. Pieces of structure that hold what they need to go in and feed, right? And a lot of this, again, we'll cover this more in depth, but it has to do a lot with what are they feeding on. You have to understand that that even these huge pieces of water, they hold areas that fish are going to find very exciting to venture into to feed. So even though there are fish that are out cruising rogue, patrolling in 500 feet of water, don't worry about, those aren't your fish right now. Those aren't the fish that you're trying to catch, okay? We're talking big lakes from shore, which means that we have to find shoreline structure that is going to bring fish in. Now, the, the best way to do this, in my opinion, is to look at the shoreline and not just the, 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 the shoreline itself, but what is the gradient, what is the slope of the land going into the water? Okay, so anytime that you can find a steep, uh, mountainside or rock face protruding into the water. A lot of times what that means is that you're gonna have pretty easy access to deep water very close to shore without having to cast too far. You don't wanna to go to a giant lake 
I mean, unless you're carp fishing, you don't want to go to a giant lake and find a big sandy beach with a big mud flat. That's not going to be where you're going to be finding fish. What you want to find are areas of the lake that fish that, that you can reach deep water without a boat and without having to cast too far. So a lot of times, you know, what I'll do is I'll actually look at the lay of the land. I'll look at the structure of the mountains and the rock faces that are surrounding the water body. And what do they look like if I were to draw a line and extend them into the water? Okay, exactly what is that slope going to look like? Am I going to be able to access some of these steeper, uh, you know, am I going to be able to access some of these drop offs close to shore without having to cast, you know, 100 feet? And another thing that I'll look at too is just back casting room. It's really important. If you're going to be doing a lot of back casting, I like to find areas where I can just flip a nice little roll cast. I can fish. 40 feet from shore and be fishing, you know, deep water that's fishy, that has food, which I'm going to talk about in a sec, uh, that, that is attractive to fish. One thing to notice, okay, pay attention to this. When you see people fishing from shore, I see this all the time on, on, you know, river fishing, on moving water, people fishing from shore are always trying to cast as far as they can. People fishing from a boat are always trying to cast as close as they can to shore. So what does that tell you is that you don't have to be a hundred miles offshore to be in productive water, to be in a productive zone. Okay. Now the third thing is that you're going to fish your flies with confidence and this is a tough one, but let me give you a real time example. Okay. We're talking the big lake that I live near. That, that, that is near my house. Okay. I will go and fish it with the same flies that I'm fishing a lot of our smaller lakes with chronomids, you know, small little micro leeches, blood worms, but I'm fishing this huge water body. And at first it's really daunting, but you have to understand that a lot of times, you know, the same bugs that are hatching on our small lakes are still hatching on our big lakes and fish are going to feed on them. It takes a little bit of time to get over the idea of fishing a number 18, chronomid on a huge lake, but let me tell you, it's very, very productive, but you have to fish these flies with confidence. I like touching on confidence a lot because when people lack a lot of confidence in what they're doing, they find it very challenging. They're always changing flies, always changing lines, leaders, extending their tippet, shortening their tippet, lighter tippet, heavier tippet. They're never fishing, right? When, when you don't have a lot of confidence in your setup, you're not fishing. You know, you're, you're not fishing, you're, you're changing your stuff all the time because you're looking for the quick fix thing that's going to work because you don't trust the setup that you have, which is probably one of the most common mistakes that anglers make in general. I make it all the time myself. If I get really impatient, sometimes just takes me slowing down going, whoa, hang on. <laughs> what, what am I actually going for here? And why am I having such a hard time committing to it? And number four is you're going to research the food source. Okay. So you're going to look up what are, what is the primary food source fish are looking for in this piece of water. And a lot of times you can do that by researching. Okay. You know, do they, and a lot of times it's done through observation, but you have to know what kind of an ecosystem is this, right? What kind of an ecosystem am I, am I dealing with? Are there migratory fish that come in and lay eggs that spawn alevin, that spawn fry? Are trout or whatever my target species is, are they going to be feeding on this food source regularly? Uh, are they insect eaters? What can I learn about the fish that I'm pursuing? All of these things, the more that you can prepare ahead of time by understanding these things, the easier your outings are going to be. I guarantee you that that is going to ring very, very true for you. So study what are the food sources that are the most prolific in these water bodies. Okay. And number five is you're going to cover some ground. Okay. I know we, we need to find areas where, where they're very attractive to fish, but a lot of times it can be a matter of just finding areas where fish are schooling, where fish are coming in, where the food is abundant, where they have a reason to come in close to shore. And that can be a tricky game sometimes, especially when you're fishing a huge piece of water. So it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily need to walk four miles in a day, but it might mean you're going to drive to a couple different spots. It might mean, you know, fishing one or two different areas of the lake. That being said, don't waste your whole time. Don't waste your whole day moving. Okay. But there is a fine line. You know, you got to know that sometimes the area that you're fishing, there's just not a lot of fish around and that's okay. You know, these huge water bodies, it's a very, very, uh, it's, it's a consistent game of here one day, gone the next, here the next day, gone the day after that. And you just, you got to find the places where fish are holding and see if you can notice any patterns. Okay. I'll tell you for sure that when I'm fishing these big lakes from shore, I usually don't try to get on the water until 10 AM, maybe 11 AM. 
The reason for that is that I don't find fish are that this time of year, not that excited until the late morning because they're waiting for those, in this instance, they're waiting for the hatch to start. They're waiting for the chronomids to start. So they're pretty, you know, they're pretty docile until the morning starts to progress into midday, into the afternoon. Most times, if I just sneak out at 2 p.m., I'll have way better fishing than if I try to get out, you know, when it's still dark out. The fish just aren't there. They have no reason to come in close to shore. Another example would be during the salmon fry migration. It's the total opposite. I'm fishing the dark, dark hours of the morning or the late hours of the evening. And the reason for that is that fish that's when the fry are out and about and that's when fish are more active feeding on the surface okay so i hope that this episode was valuable to you and before i close this out i just want to say that time is running out to register for our fly fishing accelerator workshop okay the accelerator workshop march 23rd 24th 25th is a three night workshop series and this is really going to help you. If, if this podcast has helped you at all, then the Accelerator Workshop is going to like 10x anything that you're going to get here just because we have more time to discuss some of the intricacies, some of the small details that make a huge difference when you're on the water. And I mean a huge difference, okay? We're gonna be talking your equipment, the ins and outs of your equipment, not just this is a fishing rod, okay? We're gonna be talking about the intricacies, the small, subtle details that Oftentimes people don't pay any attention to and they, they really can make a huge difference for you on the water and we're gonna maximize the way that you're gonna use your equipment. I'm not gonna tell you to rush out and buy a whole bunch of new stuff. I'm gonna look at, okay, how can we maximize what you have already? Where are some of the gaps in your equipment that maybe we can fill? And then we're gonna go deep on fly selection night two and night three, we're going to talk about implementing what makes the difference between people that have a very hard time in fly fishing and people that just seem to show up anywhere and catch fish. I'm not claiming to be one of those people because I still have plenty of days where I show up and I catch no fish, but I'm going to share with you some things that are really going to skyrocket your result to make 2021 the best season that you've ever had on the water, even if it's your first one, especially if it's your first one. It's really easy to start when you're starting with good habits. It's hard when you start with bad habits and you're trying to reverse them, okay? So you can go to flyfishuniversity.com forward slash accelerator. It's completely free. I hope to see you there. I'm very, very excited for it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on Friday's episode of Q&A Friday.